uh, I will break you all up into SMU Team 1, SMU Team 2, and NUS Team. Okay? Uh, and I propose to take uh, the SMU Combined Team's proposal first. And to the extent that you uh, either disagree with each other uh, or you don't feel uh, in a position to comment on the proposal of the other team because you've not had the opportunity to research on it, uh, please feel free to say so. Uh, and uh, as I talk about the SMU team's proposals, uh, the NUS team can also uh, feel free to chip in if you have any thoughts. I think that it, that it be more fluid, yeah? even though this is a formal process. I come to... So, this is my understanding of your proposals. SMU team one, uh, including coach, uh, that's an unfair advantage. Uh, principally, you, you, you say that uh, deliberate online falsehoods, and this is what we're talking about, DOFs, yeah? I think all of us, all three teams focus on deliberate online falsehoods and not uh, differences in opinion, not, not uh, you know, there are no shades of grey here. It's deliberate. And it's, of course, online, and it's false, and provable to be false. Yeah? Uh, you say, Team 1, that in your view, DOFs are chiefly motivated by political and financial objectives, correct? Yes? That's correct. Uh, you say that uh, existing laws may be sufficient to deal with the authors and promulgators of DOFs, but this may not always be practical. Could you just sketch out why you take that perspective? In the sense that, like I alluded to just now, the damage might be caused, the damage caused by the instantaneous spread of a falsehood sometimes has very immediate consequences. And by the time the court process is engaged to prosecute and bring the perpetrator to trial, the damage would have been done. And sometimes if the perpetrator is located in a different country, it might be impossible to get him, so to speak. So the crux of our views here is that the more practical solution is to target the intermediary, the platform in which the falsehood is promulgated, rather than uh, just focusing on the author of the falsehood. Although we definitely agree that the author should be held responsible. Hmm. Do you think that uh, extradition laws and laws on mutual legal assistance, are they helpful to uh, extend the reach of uh, national legislation that target the promulgators of DOF? Definitely those are helpful. But if we really want to stop the problem, I suppose, at, at its source, to prevent it from being disseminated, we would have to get intermediaries to take down that falsehood as soon as possible or within a practical well, period of time. Uh, what, if, what if the promulgators of DOFs are state actors or persons subject to the traditional notions of uh, sovereign or state immunity? Uh, to what extent should uh, national legislation against DOF authors uh, ex cover such actors? Or to what extent should we continue to respect uh, international law expectations uh, of sovereignty? I suppose when you talk about state actors, that does illustrate the limits of domestic legislations. We do have to respect their sovereignty. But again, this is where focusing on intermediary liability would offer us a solution. We can't directly um, prosecute that state party or actor. But what we can do within our shores is to ensure that the intermediary takes down that offending post so that our citizens are not subject to it. And hopefully that minimizes the impact. Hmm. Uh, you say that the gap in the regulatory tools in our arsenal, uh, uh, and, and it, it, the gap is in relation to what you've identified as, in my quote, if I may quote, the chief mischief uh, or the real danger, unquote, of DOFs, which is near instantaneous dissemination and access. So you're not just talking about the content, but you're talking about the virality. Am I right? That's correct. You, and I quote, you, you say that a lie can travel halfway around the world before the truth can get its shoes on, unquote. That really stuck in my mind as I was putting on my shoes this morning. <laughs> Perhaps could you expand a bit more on that? You've certainly done a lot of thinking about uh, our regulatory arsenal uh, to deal with speed and virality. Why do you think it is inadequate? So the damage is done, basically, by that piece of news being disseminated to people and the effect uh, that, well it has on consumers of that falsehood. So I think I've also cited the example of the Pizza Gate incident. And the point really is that no matter, say, how 
um, by the time you go engage the court process, you try to take it down, or you try to go through a fact-checking process, it might have reached the really extreme fringes of society who, like in that case, decide to take up arms and cause a real, uh, cause a threat to security. For example, showing up to the restaurant armed with a rifle. Right. So the point, I guess, that I've made repeatedly through these submissions is that the stopping the spread, the dissemination is a key part of the solution. And that virality, as you've observed, is really the the issue facing us today because I think many witnesses have agreed that falsehoods, deliberate falsehoods, are not a new problem. What the real issue here is the means of it spreading, mm -hmm. which is online, as this select committee has recognized. Yeah. Uh, legislation uh, around falsehoods uh, in the real world versus the online space uh, have defined uh, concepts of falsehood and, and uh, there are commentators and uh, contributors to the select committee over the last week and a half uh, who have uh, taken the position that it is not possible uh, for the law uh, to sensibly define what a deliberate online falsehood is uh, and to, in so far as your paper purports to argue that you are able to, to wrap your hands around the problem and deal with the virality of DOFs, you first need to be able to define that. Uh, how would you respond uh, to that criticism uh, of your pr proposal? I would actually fully agree that it is very hard to define what falsehoods are. I think um, one possible solution I think it's reflected in the German Network Enforcement Act is to carve out a certain category of manifestly unlawful acts which should be subject to such immediate or expeditious takedown. I mean, I'm full, in full agreement with the witnesses who have explained how there are different types of misinformation. So, I mean, sometimes a piece of satire itself is a deliberate falsehood, but the intent is quite different from something more malicious. Mm. So. To that extent, and I actually did make this point in our written submissions, some sort of fake news uh, legislation that, uh, that attempts to create a substantive offence of fake news is probably very difficult and not desirable. But what we should do is perhaps tap on our existing pieces of legislation which are flexible enough to deal with these situations and perhaps allow the relevant regulatory body the power to order a takedown in suitable circumstances. Understand. Uh, your, the, the pillar of your proposal revolves around uh, uh, placing legal responsibility and not just corporate social responsibility on the intermediaries of the social media space. Now, you know, these are very large companies that uh, are, if I may quote some of the uh, other speakers, the, the information superhighways of the internet. Uh, they're not just here to serve Singapore and Singaporeans, they serve the world, whether as a search engine, whether as a, a social media connector. Uh, they've given uh, submissions on the hundreds of hours of video that are uploaded every hour and the millions or billions of posts that are made in the course of a month or a year. Uh, so many of these entities will argue that they are not content providers. They, they hence should not be held legally responsible for what appears on their platforms or on their search results. Uh, they are mere conduits or highways of information. They cannot be responsible for what cars people drive, how fast they drive, how recklessly or carefully they do so, in, in, in fact, which direction they head, uh, what passengers they carry or what goods are on their vehicles on their superhighway. Uh, even if it is explicitly illegal. Uh, some others have pointed out that uh, uh, the algorithms uh, shepherd what people can or cannot see, do or do not see, read or do not read. Uh, and so, on the one hand, entities will say, we can't be possibly be held responsible. Your legislation that requires us to arbitrate a truth from falsehood is something that is not possible to be done. They do not want to do it. And what they do is a matter of uh, corporate social responsibility, which they take very seriously, but don't legislate. 
don't make it our responsibility. We can't be held responsible, so, so they say. On the other hand, there are others, you know, very uh, uh, eminent professors and uh, researchers who say that uh, they've been able to do it for child pornography. They've been able to do it for hate speech. And it's not just uh, uh, purely on request, but they <coughs> actually have active mechanisms to discern and they will take down. Uh, so in a way, they seem to be able to do what you say they should be doing. But the difference is here it is on falsehoods. How would you respond to that? How would, you, how, how would your proposal uh, face up against mm. the protestations of companies whose annual revenue may exceed the GDP of some countries? The immediate response is that nations around the world have, in fact, taken a stand against all these large entities. Europe is a good example. I think in the European Court of Justice, if I'm not wrong, certain actions have been taken against Google, Facebook for, I think, if I'm not wrong, it's copyright infringement. So the point really is that there is a recognition, international recognition that intermediaries have to be held to task for certain uh, breaches, certain breaches of norms, mm -hmm. and that they owe a certain degree of responsibility, although the extent of that responsibility, I suppose, is for each individual state to decide. As to these intermediaries saying that they are not content providers and mere conduits, <clears throat> I think it's clear that certain social media platforms, by the fact of presentation, they do in fact uh, um, create some sort of image. They are in um, some sort of content provider, as it were. But the more important point is that they do owe, I think, a certain duty by hosting that uh, uh, content because of the effects it has. And, they, and by dint of, their pow of th that power, they do owe a uh, corresponding responsibility to take it down when there are certain adverse consequences. And in fact, I think the algorithms in which a certain information is presented to users is an, exam is an example of how intermediaries are not mere conduits. They do, in a sense, uh, select the kind of information that is presented to consumers. And that in and of itself can sometimes create what has been referred to as an echo chamber effect. Or it could lead to falsehoods being propagated endlessly simply because that consumer is inclined towards certain, uh, as a type of um, a type of news, perhaps. So the point really is that regulation, there should be some sort of a regulation of intermediaries, and intermediary li liability is, is actually a well-established concept across various jurisdictions, while acknowledging that perhaps it, it's used in the context of copyright infringement, intellectual property, but that doesn't mean it can't be adapted to issues of free speech. I look at your paragraphs that examine the pros and cons of strict liability, uh, no liability, as well as your safe harbour approach. And I, I correct me if I'm wrong, your re recommendation is, is to use the safe harbour approach. Yes, that's and, correct. Uh, I'll, I'll come to, I'll ask you in a while to, to articulate what you mean by that, but specific to your proposal, you recommend uh, that you gel the best and the worst of the notice and takedown approach with the best and the worst of the judicial notice and takedown approach. Uh, so if you may just succinctly tell us what do you mean by safe harbour approach in respect of dealing with the virality of the, the DOFs? Uh, why do you think a merger of a notice and takedown and judicial notice and takedown uh, will, will, will be able to address the cons of both approaches? And third, uh, to what extent would your strategy and recommendation uh, address and balance concerns over uh, free speech uh, and managing the severe harms posed by DOFs? So in that order, and succinctly, please. Essentially, the safe harbour regimes means that while intermediaries can be held liable for per per um, spreading falsehoods, but if they adhere to a series of um, guidelines, they are not liable. So safe harbour, basically, if they follow that series of guidelines, like expeditiously taking down false information. As to why a merger of notice and notice and notice and judicial, sorry, notice and takedown and notice and judicial takedown 
it, we recognize that there are disadvantages to both systems. So for example, the notice and judicial takedown regime offers uh, some sort of independent assessment of what that falsehood is, but at the same time, it's a bit slow and cumbersome because you have to go through the court process. On the other hand, notice and takedown is fast. Once the intermediary is placed on notice, they have to take it down within a certain period of time. However, the problem is that intermediaries might not be best placed to verify or assess what uh, breach of I, I suppose, what is sedition, to give an example. Mm. So we don't want to sort of encourage self-censorship because the concern, I think, raised in the context of Germany is that these intermediaries will end up self-censoring. They'd rather take it down immediately rather than be liable. So as to how we merge them, the proposal, I suppose, is to carve out a certain category of, uh, I suppose, uh, broad term would be mani so manifestly unlawful that it must be taken down immediately on notice. But for speech that doesn't rise, or rather falsehoods which don't rise to that category, we can wait for an independent assessment by a court. Hence the, the proposed merger of notice and takedown and notice and judicial takedown. And I think this does address the concerns over free speech because it balances on the one hand the right to, I suppose, um, express your opinions it protects the rights of intermediaries if we follow that notice and judicial takedown process because through that judicial process, I think the affected party has a chance to explain why this should not be taken down or perhaps the intermediary has a chance to show why it should not be held liable. But on the same, same hand, if we, by carving out that category of manifestly unlawful subject to an immediate notice and takedown, this does address the concerns of the consequences of unchecked falsehoods. Yeah, thank you. And this is where it segues into SMU Team 2's proposal, which actually come with specific provisions. I'll come back to you in a short while as to whether you agree with the, the way they've drafted the, 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 the provisions. But can I ask uh, Simran and Gloria, uh, you have in a way, I, I, I would take it that you agree with the Team 1's paper that uh, the, the, the virality uh, of DOFs is a risk and therefore you've proposed uh, a takedown. Uh, but your proposal involves uh, an executive takedown with a recourse and appeal to the president. Uh, and I want to, to ask you to comment on your dean's proposal. You have parliamentary uh, privilege, but not <laughs> academic privilege in terms of your grades. Huh? So, so I leave you to answer as you wish. But as far as parliament is concerned, you are fully protected. Okay? Uh, he has recommended... You know, you know who your dean is, right? Prof. Goh Yihan. <laughs> That's a very important question to answer. Uh, he has proposed an executive, I'm not wrong, executive takedown with judicial oversight as a way to balance uh, 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 speed as well as, uh, as oversight. Uh, because your proposal is executive makes a decision and another member of the executive, although it's the presidential office, uh, exercise oversight. I'd like you to respond to your dean's proposal vis-a-vis -vis yours, which is better in your view in balancing the rights of speech and the concerns uh, on uh, abuse or misabuse versus the risk of DOF, that's one. And I'd like you to re respond to SMU Team 1's paper, which essentially sketches out a similar approach, but different in terms of mechanics, which is uh, combining uh, notice and takedown, which is members of the public write in, uh, and there's a legal obligation on the intermediary if it's manifestly unlawful, if I may quote Team 1, uh, with, uh, and then to take down, versus the other approach that they've made, which is a judicial order to be made before takedown uh, can be effected. Uh, I'm not sure whether Team 1 has articulated what the right of recourse is, but I'll come to you in a while. Maybe Team 2. So thank you, Mr. Lee. So I'd like to start off with just giving a brief overview of what we have proposed. So for, um, as you can see on page six of our submissions, we have come up with three various stakeholders that we would like to look at and as to how they could combat online falsehoods. So as to your question about the executive power, we are looking at um, the minister being responsible for removing online falsehoods. So in that aspect, we are looking at um, we like to, um, in, con in contrary with what our dean has said, um, we are of the opinion that 
the content of this kind of publications for this executive um, intervention would be those that gravely threatens Singapore's security and economic life. So in that sense, the threshold for this kind of information would be a much higher one that warrants such an immediate response from the executive. And um, going back to the first principles of checks and balances in Singapore's constitution, I think what um, our dean would... Um, our dean um, is of the opinion that the judicial oversight provides an inter-branch check as opposed to our objection to the president, which is an intra-branch check. Mm. So as to who is better, I would say, um, if you're looking at something that is uh, a stronger check and balance, I would say the inter-branch check would be something that would be more appropriate. So um, I think my, the, dean, the dean's opinion in that aspect would um, warrant a, a stronger check and balance on um, whether the minister's decision. However, when we look at um, the judicial power, which is under prong two, we see that there's also an appeal process into the judicial um, process of whether or not the content is false. So I think what our group's stance is that there are, we provide um, a wider avenue. So there are two avenues that they could go from, the judicial and the executive um, prong aspect. So I think um, the difference between the two would be actually whether or not the content is threatening Singapore security. And I think that, that is very important because that, um, that shows how, how fast we have to respond to that online falsehood. And I think um, if, if, for example, Singapore's um, security is threatened, I think the minister would be in a better position as opposed to court processes which take up a longer time. Thank you. I'm, I'm concerned about the uh, oversight, which is, uh, yes, the minister may take down if it's uh, of the view that it's a grave risk, uh, but uh, the right to speech, uh, to assert that what you've taken down, in fact, is, uh, is honest and accurate, it's opinion and it's not fact, it's, or it's factual and it's not falsehood, uh, and the appeal mechanism is intra-branch as opposed to inter-branch. Uh, as a law student, you would know that uh, the function of the judiciary is exclusively uh, within the realm of the judiciary under the Constitution and the right of judicial review should be taken away in the most scarce of uh, circumstances. Uh, would you not agree that uh, an appeal process intra-branch versus an appeal process inter-branch, uh, what are the pros and cons? Mm, so I would say, I think um, judicial process is very important in, in establishing checks and balances. So I would say inter-branch check would be a much um, appropriate solution to the problem. But in respect of your prong three, where you propose uh, that an appeal or avenue of accountability is an objection to the office of the president, uh, are you saying that on top of that, there is a right of judicial review? I think that's a possible avenue we could look at. Thank you. Yes. Maybe I'll go back to team one uh, in respect of uh, accountability. You do recommend in your paper that uh, other than the, uh, the two uh, takedown approaches, instead of judicial takedown, there's also the possibility, uh, as Prof. Warren Chick had articulated and you cited him, uh, for an executive takedown. Uh, what would be the safeguards uh, in respect of executive takedown? Yes, it's speedy. But how do you guard uh, free speech through accountability provisions? I think in terms of executive takedown, my own personal preference is that perhaps the Attorney General's chambers could take out an urgent ex parte application to bring down, take down that um, falsehood using the judicial process. And there are inherent safeguards within that process. So the affected person could apply to set it aside and the usual um, safeguards are built in place. So to that extent, I don't quite uh, agree with Team 2's uh, prong three. I think the, con the underlying concern there, which is speed, can be addressed by their prong two, which I think dovetails with our own proposal by getting uh, another branch, the executive branch, to execute it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, can I ask Team 2 now? Because in addition to... Uh, the concept of takedown, which deals with virality, you, you also have other proposals, you know, specifically two. One is on laws on disclosure of affiliation, disclosure of financing, uh, and your other proposal is in relation to 
tax incentives or disincentives to drive intermediaries towards committing to funding research to tackle DOFs. Uh, I deal first with disclosure. And uh, at paragraph, uh, let's pull out uh, the paper. Paragraph on disclosure, page 9, yes. Disclosure laws. Page 10, top of page 10, uh, para 3, your concern is how, with how a disclosure law affects individual rights to free speech under Article 14.1. Uh, to what extent uh, are your concerns valid? That disclosure, getting people to disclose more, being more open, to what extent does that chill freedom of speech? I, I find it hard to, to wrap my hands around it. Perhaps you can share with us. I think um, it's a very tricky issue because um, disclosure actually gives us more information than, than restricting information. So it's like a, it's a counterintuitive approach to it. But on one hand, it's, it's a form of um, nuance and very subtle restriction of freedom of speech because it makes it creates some kind of a stifling environment in the sense that when you disclose your sponsors and who is um, behind that information, I think um, when it comes to uh, adver advertising companies who want to sell a product, they sell an information and you buy the idea, I think um, for them to disclose their sponsors, I think um, it will create an implication that um, people will not buy into their ideas. And I think... Um, it might create, I mean, it's an open, it remains an open question because I think our courts have not addressed this issue whether or not it's a restriction on our free speech. But I think we must be sensitive to the context that it might um, create a stifling environment for people who um, are wanting to sell an idea. Hmm. Well, you know, there have always been concerns about people with certain motivations and then dressing up separately. And therein lies uh, part of the problem of DOF. A person may present himself as uh, independent or as an eminent person uh, independent professional, but actually being motivated uh, by state objectives or by financial objectives that are extraneous to his credit, cred his, uh, his 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 position. Uh, you see in in magazines and newspapers, including in Singapore, that when something is uh, paid advertising, uh, even if the the, the text uh, seems to be objective reporting, it is upfront. Uh, and not too long ago, there was a debate over whether social media influencers were actually trying to. Uh, sell a product on behalf of a company should state so, or whether um, effective advertising by dressing it up as personal preference uh, uh, should be permitted. So perhaps you could respond to, to what I've just said, and maybe Team One could tell us whether you, you, you take the same view on disclosure laws. I know it's not in your paper. If you would like to decline to comment, I, I, would, I would respect that. Team Two, please. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Lee. So um, in relation to um, the disclosure laws and how um, our our main issue here uh, with regards to how um, it may stifle the 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 party who is advertising on the platform is that because they might not be willing to open up about who sponsors them because that opens them up to a, a wide variety of implications that their their audience might. Um, accuse them of, and if they want to avoid this, then there comes a dilemma for them because they want to advertise their products, but in order to do so, they need to open up about their sponsors. So in that sense, that creates the very stifling effect because they they are kind of caught in between two, I guess, um, two, two ends where they want to sell their product, but in order to do so, they need to open themselves up to quite a few implications and, or maybe accusations from their audience. And because of that, we feel that in that sense, it might be stifling in that nature and might impede on their actual freedom of speech in that sense. Thank you very much. Team One, any quick comments on that? I think in our, in our view, um, we don't think that uh, disclosure laws are uh, necessary at this point in time. Um, in a sense, um, we find that if there's an intermediary liability to have legislation that's already set out, uh, it sets a kind of an end goal 
that intermediaries uh, can work towards and they know exactly uh, how to meet that goal. So in terms of safe harbour regimes. Mm. So uh, we, they can choose different ways that they want to regulate their own companies, uh, whether they want to set up teams or how do you want to be responsible or in front of public? So in terms of disclosure laws as to how precisely uh, they would like to uh, regulate or any company regulations or disclose certain policies, um, we, I don't think it's really necessary to tackle, to have these laws to tackle this um, ultimate problem of deliberate on life's falsehoods here. Thank you. Can I just challenge you there a little bit? Yeah. Uh, your proposal is a safe harbour approach where to deal and nip the, in, in the bud the problem of the virality of deliberate online falsehoods. Mm. Uh, one, whether it's an individual or an executive or judiciary needs to, to get a sense of and then be sure that this is likely to be false before you, you take action to, to nip it in the bud. Uh, would it not be so that uh, disclosure of who you are, who's backing you, who's instigating you, who's funding you, would that not give some uh, sense as to whether there is some concern or some suspicion that one should look a bit more carefully? And that would then, in fact, aid and supplement your safe harbour approach involving takedown. Um, I think from our point of view... We think that it should be more of a case-by-case -case, uh, kind of basis. So, for example, if there is a particular uh, piece of, uh, a particular post that is uh, clearly unlawful, and of course an intermediary uh, fails to remove it, and they do get um, certain uh, prosecutions for that, uh, we believe that in that um, investigation process, there will be uh, certain types of uh, investigations and disclosures made. So as to whether the laws are required to step in to require them to really disclose these, um, it might, uh, in, in, in a sense, uh, it, I, I'm not sure as to whether it's really uh, necessary as to, to, to the end. Um, You know, what you've said is that uh, in the course of investigating uh, possible infringement of legislation such as the Sedition Act and other legislation, uh, one would uncover uh, who, who one's backers are, whether it's state, non-state, organised crime or whatever. Uh, here I'm talking about uh, uh, disclosure requirements that may flag up uh, what is or is not uh, dubious and possibly doff amidst a whole wave of information out there. So one is preemptive and help you to, to scope. The other is uh, investigative, which is post, when the harm is done and you're investigating. Uh, in that respect, uh, are you supportive of, you know, if, if you've read, honest ads uh, legislation being proposed in the US to require, no doubt, in, in the realm of uh, electoral uh, uh, races, a disclosure of who your backers are. Are you a state, is a state funding this? Is a state-linked state uh, corporation funding this? Is it a local American company? Is it uh, uh, from another country? And who's backing it? Uh, would you support such legislation? Actually, in that regard, uh, if, for example, such disclosures, uh, if it's uh, married with, for example, the safe harbour safe harbor regimes, mm. then we would think yes, in those categories where the speech has... a has resulted in certain consequences and we find it necessary to really investigate and discover why mm. because uh, what the intermediary has been doing, then uh, yes, uh, we, we do think so. Thank you. I move on to team two. Your other proposal is on tax incentives and tax disincentives uh, in a bid to get uh, social media companies to put the money where the mouth is, to put in uh, money in research. Uh, perhaps you quickly sketch that for the benefit of uh, my colleagues on the panel. And in the context of the size of Singapore, uh, the amounts of revenues contributed by Singapore and Singaporeans to the revenues of these companies, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, large bulk of it which goes to these companies from advertising from the rest of the world, to what extent do you believe 
that such in tax proposals will cause the social media companies to seriously invest in R&D to tackle DOF? So for our uh, economic incentive proposal, our rationale was that um, because comp companies uh, um, like the bigger companies uh, who focus more on communication channels or search engines, they tend to want to profit maximize, as we all know. So we are leveraging on that characteristic of these companies. And our, our approach has two main um, aspects. Firstly, that we need to make sure that their income, mainly their um, advertising revenue, is taxable in Singapore. And then once we establish that, then uh, the incentive system kicks in where we uh, so-called reward them for establishing or creating algorithms or R&D projects to help um, identify and take down um, prevalent DOFs on their, on their communication channels. So based on the idea that these companies want to profit maximize, we can we reasonably have assumed that um, the, the deductions that they receive in that aspect uh, through tax incentives and and such um, other methods, they would there would be no um, major reason for them to object to this because, in that sense, they are also benefiting while helping us um, tackle the problems of DOFs. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's very clear. Uh, now move on to NUS now. Yeah, your proposal centers around at pages. Uh, 9, 10, and 11, around a proposal to construct a multifactorial sanctions regime. And uh, the paragraphs that follow, correct me if I'm wrong, appear to be uh, considerations that either mitigate or aggravate potential sanctions that flow from a breach of criminal provisions. Uh, the rest of your paper focuses on constitutional concerns, which uh, no doubt I think, Rachel, it reflects your, your DNA, uh, and, and very important considerations, if I may add. Uh, but uh, we are looking at proposals. What do you think the Select Committee should be looking at in terms of concrete proposals? Uh, am I right? So a couple of questions. Am I right to say that implicitly your proposal is for existing laws to be used and criminal sanctions to be determined and adjudicated on by a court based on your multifactorial sanctions regime. My second question is, what are your thoughts about the SMU Team 1 and Team 2's proposals that require legislative uh, interventions to deal with the speed and virality uh, of DOFs and the harms uh, that can be quickly associated with such speed and virality. What are your, your comments and observations on their proposal? Uh, and third, what are your thoughts on disclosure laws, as we just discussed, and with the tax incentives proposal uh, that SMU Team 2 has uh, put up? If I may get your succinct comments on th the questions I've raised. Okay. Um Our proposal on a multifactorial sanctions regime is does not offer any concrete proposals that Parliament can consider. We believe that the the concrete solutions that Parliament comes up to practically regulate deliberate online falsehoods is for the experts to determine. What we humbly offer is a reasoning process. In terms of Parliament arriving at the concrete solutions, we believe that the process is really what matters and what we offer is the constitutional perspective. Yeah. So all the factors that come under the multifactorial sanctions regime, they are not new. They are actually applied by the courts in assessing damages for the tort of defamation. As I've quoted, uh, as we have quoted in, um, uh, we have quoted the Roy Nung case. And we will, uh, I think the committee has recognised in the Green Paper that deliberate online falsehoods basically occur in a myriad of circumstances. 
And what we propose in our submission is that these myriad um, situations in which deliberate online falsehoods are proliferated online be taken into account in the constitutional balancing process. So for example, let's take the example of um, the uh, Mrs. Hillary Clinton and the pedophilia ring rumor that has circulated virally online. If we place it on the balancing scale, it would be basically we would be evaluating the interest of that rumor as free speech. And as we have discussed at length just now, there is no value in that. So the balance would tip in favor of public order concerns. The key question is really the skill that we apply. Because the interest of whatever speech, falsehoods, and public order concerns are incommensurable mm. entities that we balance. So the scale that we propose is a more rights-oriented scale. So whatever, um, in, in practical terms, this means that um, whatever concrete solutions that Parliament comes up to regulate such deliberate online falsehoods that fall under the category of the, uh, Mrs. Clinton's rumour would have to be, for example, reasonable or proportionate. Mm -hmm. So I understand that you, you're not uh, in your paper proposing any specific architecture, uh, but uh, you have here uh, on, on, the, on the same panel as you, uh, teams or groups that have proposed uh, certain specific ideas. Uh, I accept, or I believe they accept that the legislation alone is not a panacea and that uh, they've respond, or you've all responded to uh, uh, when Ms. Ms. Chai Yong asked you that uh, actually education and other measures are equally important. Uh, but as far as legislative architecture is concerned, uh, based on your principles, constitutional and legal principles that you've articulated, uh, what would your views be in respect of what SMU has proposed? Are they in line with your constitutional principles as you've outlined? Um, I'm afraid that we are a bit out of our depth in this area. Um, and um, we apologise for that. Don't apologise. Oh, it's, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so, thank you. Um, but we would like to emphasise that um, we are not trying to basically dictate or um, offer concrete solutions that we are not experts on and um, as we have already mentioned um, what we can only offer is um, a reasoning process to getting to the final concrete solutions oh, thank you i respect um, that uh, joel I, I suppose in the event that we are to offer a suggestion then perhaps um, on page nine of our submissions we do mention that Perhaps if you do decide to have a council of peers or an adjudicatory body, then perhaps our suggestion is that um, that it should be independent and you could include personnel from uh, the government or other social media or tech companies and even legal representatives and how this uh, could be the constitution of an adjudicatory body that may help in determining whether something is a deliberate online falsehood or not. And in addition to that, uh, we have this uh, multifactorial sanctions regime mm -hmm. to suggest some ideas that you might want to take into consideration. And I think on that note, we have uh, tried to summarise it neatly under three Cs. So firstly, under culpability. So you first look at the state of mind, the mens rea, whether it's uh, malice, or if it's done recklessly, or if it's done negligently. So in the case of um, recklessness, uh, under the uh, Go Chok Tong case, it was mentioned that, um, that the maker of a false statement made recklessly without considering or caring whether it's true or false is treated as if he knew it to be false and has acted in malice. 
However, it's an open question whether gross negligence would suffice to attract liability. So for instance, if you are just someone who merely just uh, circulated the information and it was done negligently, then perhaps a lower level of culpability should be considered. Mm -hmm. And um, the second C that we have is looking at the culprit himself or herself. And what is the role of the culprit? Is the person an author of the information or is the person a circulator of the information? If the person is the author of the information, it's more likely than not that it would constitute a deliberate online falsehood. However, if it's someone who has merely circulated the information, then perhaps um, the select committee should be more forgiving on the respect to that person. And in addition to the role of the culprit, you also have the identity of the culprit, where you can consider the reach of the comment about, like, for instance, like how wide the information is spread to the person's uh, viewership or authorship, yeah, viewership, and whether the culprit has represented himself to be one who speaks the truth. And finally, whether this uh, culprit is a first time or a repeat offender. So that's under the second point of the culprit. And thirdly, when you are considering consequences, we're looking at the nature and the magnitude of the harm that is done. And what engages the interests of the public may not necessarily be in public interest, which is what uh, we looked at earlier. Just Thank now. you. Uh, one question, page uh, 10 where you say that uh, publishing false statements of fact online recklessly should suffice to attract liability. So when we talk about DOF, we just talk about deliberate online falsehoods. And the question is, what level of mens rea should suffice to fix uh, liability? And not talking about extent of culpability, but liability. Uh, some, some people think it should be intention, deliberate intention. Uh, but your proposal is that recklessness should suffice. Can I get that? Uh, get your views? Is, is that your considered opinion? It should be rough, not doff. Yes, Rachel. Yeah, very me. So the short answer to that is that we, um, in the whole legal um, legal framework of laws, existing laws that already target false statements like defamation. Hmm. Um, we quote the case of uh, Go Chok Tong and Jeratnam Joshua Benjamin that where the court has held that the maker of a false statement made recklessly without considering or caring whether it be false is treated as if he knew it to be false and had acted in malice. Mm. Um, so in order for the whole existing architecture, uh, architecture I beg your pardon, to be consistent, um, this, we, we propose that this principle um, should also similarly apply in the upcoming um, so it's if not just any, reading of a law, but as a matter of policy, you're recommending that uh, you should adopt a similar uh, menstrual threshold. Am I correct? Um, and, um, okay, thank you for your question. Um, then um, we would propose that for recklessness, this would only technically, hypothetically, be engaged if when we consider the role of the purveyor of this um, online falsehood. So as Joel has mentioned just now, if the maker of the statement has represented himself to be objective and his online website is receiving basically large human, uh, traffic online, a lot of people visit his website, then I think it, we, we think that it is reasonable for the law to hold him to a higher standard. I understand. Thank you very much. Um, your page nine, yeah, uh, where which Joel had uh, just read uh, or pointed to uh, on the rule against bias, where you say that I quote: "Should the creation of an adjudicatory body be in the offing, the select committee should ensure that the composition of the panel does not fall foul of the rule against bias. Perhaps such body should comprise of a council of peers instead of personnel from the government or social media tech companies." Unquote. Uh, you have uh, heard earlier uh, uh, from Ms. Chia Yong Yong when she brought you through some tables that uh, at its highest or at its worst, uh, deliberate online falsehoods could be orchestrated by state actors uh, as an alternative to kinetic warfare uh, to destroy uh, a society, an opponent, an opponent country or a target country from within. So it's a national security attack uh, to 
either through a drip approach or through an acute attack uh, through the online realm uh, to wither away uh, another country. And it's a national security issue. You know, when it's kinetic warfare, you send the armed forces, you don't delegate it to auxiliary officers from a private company. Likewise, when you have a terrorist attack or a, a planned attack in, in a country in Singapore, you will, the police will go right at it. There's no concern about rules, rule, rules of bias and all. Uh, but when it comes to, say, national security concerns regarding DOF, uh, do you think it is appropriate for the government to delegate it to an independent panel of peers uh, and not have any representation or role or participation in dealing with the national security risk posed by DOF? Um, so, um, the way we would um, respond to your question is that um, the rule against bias and the other rule that we have written down, the fair hearing rule, we start off from the position that these two rules are common law rules of natural justice, which the High Court in Stansfield Business has said that these are not some arcane doctrine of law. They represent what the ordinary man expects and accepts as fair procedure for the resolution of conflicts and disputes by a decision-making body that affects his interest, and that is on page eight of our submission. We accept that there might be exceptional situations of national security that would force, uh, that would compel executive action that deviates from these two um, common law rules of natural justice. But in light of the evidence that has been presented before the committee by several other, other members of the public, the main concern is really how we define falsehoods, moving away from the theoretical um, justifications for free speech. Yes. And to be consistent, uh, and to be consistent with what the High Court has said about these two rules reflecting a universal desire on a part of society, to see that even in these exceptional situations th threatening the security and possibly even survivab survivability of Singapore, that um, the rule of law is still upheld <coughs> and that these, decision these decisions are not made arbitrarily. Would you, would you, now, now we have a, a proposal that you've heard from SMU on uh, how, according to them, they balance uh, uh, free speech with uh, tackling the harms of DOF. Uh, and I, I, I would take another perspective from the proposal, which is that uh, the executive will act or some authority will act, but you protect uh, against infringements of the rule of bias and other uh, other principles of natural justice, if you articulate in your paper, are addressed through uh, oversight. That means uh, appeal, ex parte, or inter partes, uh, uh, oversight uh, in the case of uh, Team 2 to the Office of the President, Team 1, it's a judicial oversight. Would that take care of your natural justice concerns in these extreme national security situations? Um, we agree. We believe that, um, no, not we believe that, the courts have held that judicial review is the engine of the rule of law. And regardless of whether executive action or legislative action is taken in the extreme circumstances involving national security, the courts would, the courts have held that they would assess what the real question is. If it is a question involving policy, um, foreign affairs or issues not involving questions of law, the courts would not review those. Yeah. GCHQ. Those nature of questions. Yes. yes. Thank you. Uh, so, so in your view, judicial review uh, is a way to address uh, concerns about natural justice and concerns about potential abuse of legislative powers. Is that correct? Um, yes, if, um, 
you would permit me to illustrate with an yes. example. So in the case of um, Yong Vui Kong that has dragged on for quite long, the court actually reviewed the clemency, the, cons the constitutional power of the president to basically the clemency power. Hmm. And the court has held that if, um, that how the president exercises his clemency power is something that the president himself decides. The constitution has vested that discretion in him, yes. which the court would not review. But if in the process of arriving at that decision, which judicial review actually tackles, it, the, the courts review the decision-making process, but not the decision itself. So if in the, de the decision-making process, if, let's say, um, questions of law have been engaged, the courts being the um, authoritative arbiters of what the law is, they would intervene and review those issues. Thank you very much. Uh, my last question, and if I just ask you to respond very briefly. Uh, you've, you've all said a lot, you've presented a lot, uh, a good discussion. Maybe one from each team could share with us one takeaway you'd like the select committee to have from your submissions and your oral testimony. What is that one thing that you think uh, we should uh, definitely bring away with us? Uh, maybe start off with uh, NUS first, since uh, we've just had a discussion. What is that one thing, uh, succinctly? Joel? Not just as a law student or professional, but as a young Singaporean in Singapore. I think uh, there are two main points that we want the select committee to consider. Mm -hmm. And firstly, in relation to uh, deliberate online falsehoods and free speech, that the deliberate online falsehoods law would limit the right to free speech, uh, that, um, it, that the liberal online falsehoods law would consider in the balancing approach the right to free speech and to look at it from these two perspectives and to take um, necessary considerations into uh, thought. And through this, we propose the multifactorial sanctions regime in terms of the three Cs, in terms of the culpability, the culprit and the consequences. And these are some factors that the select committee might want to deliberate on and consider in the future. Mm. And finally, we are also concerned that the right to religious freedom and the principle of secularism, that uh, it could be undermined uh, and should false religious beliefs fall within the ambit of deliberate online falsehoods. And so, um, we propose ultimately that the select committee should distinguish between false facts that are designed to mislead and how those should fall under deliberate online falsehoods. And in contrast, questionable visions of religious truth should not fall under deliberate online falsehoods. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. you. Um, Gloria and Simran, what is that key takeaway, the most important point that you'd like to drive home? I think um, one key value we'd like the select committee to take note of would be, um, I think whatever legislations or whatever proposals uh, that are pushed out, there must be accountability mm. um, to the people and to the various stakeholders that are involved. And I think through exploring um, a holistic approach towards it, I think that would be the best solution. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Gloria and Simran. Maybe uh, Yi Xiong and Lee Sin. Um, I echo Gloria's um, views in that um, one takeaway is that we think that the different parties, there are different parties involved here, and I think the time has come for social media intermediaries to not only just take responsibility, but the fact that they should um, be legally uh, obligated to, do, uh, to exercise these responsibilities. And in doing so, um, while there are concerns as to how exactly they can exercise um, their obligations, um, we think that the clear legislations, clear laws, uh, safe, clear safe harbour regimes will help to alleviate some of these concerns. And so uh, we would say um, we really urge uh, this uh, committee to consider say, the different parties involved and also to ensure that the legislations laid out are a nuance in the aspect.